Wonderful. Radek, thank you so much for joining Pleasure. us here at the Warsaw Security Forum. I want to kick off, actually, by getting your assessment of where we are today in terms of the public sentiment. We have a lot of elections coming up in Europe, certainly here in Poland as well. And frankly, uh, I can smell the fear with regards to what could potentially happen in, in 2024 with the U.S. presidential elections. Walk us through your assessment of where we are today. Well, let's start with the U.S. Um, I think Ukraine was very lucky to have President Biden uh, at the White House when the Russians invaded uh, because uh, Donald Trump is no friend of Ukraine. Let's remember what his first impeachment was about. He was blackmailing President Zelensky uh, to give him, Trump, um, uh, compromising material on Hunter Biden. And, um, uh, and unless that happens, he wouldn't uh, give any arms to Ukraine. Uh, and let's also remember that um, at the Republican convention at which uh, Donald Trump was nominated, uh, he was sending messages to Russia that uh, if Russia helps him in social media and so on, um, he will end this uh, Ukraine business. And Russia did help him. Um, so I think uh, if he were to be re-elected, um, uh, Ukraine uh, would be in trouble. Uh, now, there are some sources of uh, anxiety here, but they are completely different. Poland still overwhelmingly supports help for Ukraine and wishes Ukraine to win. But we had a million Ukrainians living in Poland before the war, uh, another million genuine war refugees, 95% women and children, uh, have come to Poland. They were warmly welcomed by spontaneously people going to railway stations and border crossings and helping. I had 10 Ukrainian uh, people living in my house for a few weeks. Um, but, you know, we didn't have a 10% a, a uh, reserve in our educational system, a 10% reserve in our health system. So, you know, after a couple of years, when people hear Ukrainian in the, in the lines, you know, for those services, there, are, there is obviously some tension. And there are always political entrepreneurs who take advantage of such, um, of such feelings. So, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's become a, a, a little more problematic. Um, but there are ways of fixing it. You know, Poland needs to uh, take advantage of the recovery plan from the European Union to upgrade our health service. And, of, and the simplest solution is for Ukraine to win and for the Ukrainian refugees to be able to go home. Yes. What do you think is the realistic outlook for a win for Ukraine? Well, I think if, we, if, if, if the U.S. had supplied them long-range weapons a year ago, maybe it would be over by now. No? And in terms of the timeline today? Well, on the whole, these colonial wars take, take a decade. Mm. Think the British in North America. Mm. Think the French in Indochina or in Algeria. Think the Portuguese in Angola and Mozambique. Think uh, uh, others. And the reason for that is that for a colonial war to end, <coughs> the leaders of the metropolis have to conclude <coughs> that A, it was a mistake. B, that the objective of recolonizing is not worth the current expenditure in blood and treasure. And Putin is not at that point yet. Also because most of these wars are ended by a different team that started them. So that, that could be a game changer, but, um, but we don't have control over it. Talk to me about this. So when you think about what happens next, um, you mentioned uh, colonial worlds taking a decade. The attention span of most people is much shorter than that. On social media, it's far shorter. And for taxpayers generally, whether they be sitting in Europe or in the United States, um, looking at that tax bill at the end of the year, certainly, um, and perhaps sadly, does have an impact <coughs> on the things that they think are the most important. Ukraine is definitely coming under scrutiny in terms of not the perhaps the ideals behind the conflict and the cause itself, but certainly in terms of the cost, the price tag. So what is it in your mind that the Zelensky government has to get right in the next six to 12 months in order to keep that public momentum. He's done an incredible job thus far in terms of drumming up public support, but the message perhaps needs to change. Actually, from the US point of view, this war has been an excellent piece of business. Think about it this way. For 10% of the American annual defense budget, Ukrainians have destroyed half the Russian army. What's not to like? Mm. 
So that should be his pitch. His pitch should be, give me some more weapons so that I can destroy the other half and defang Russia as an empire. Uh, allow Russia to become a normal nation state investing in its own people rather than trying to recon reconquer its former colonies. One of the concerns, of course, is that depending on what happens in the 2024 elections in the United States, um, there could be a lessening of the money that heads to Ukraine, whether that be on the humanitarian front or the weapons front. Today, uh, the Europeans, they can help with the fiscal, but not potentially the weapons. And that's just as a direct result of the military that's industrial. Right. That's not quite right. Remember that uh, um, the U.S. is a federation. We are a confederation. Every, everything U.S. does for Ukraine goes through Washington. Mm. In Europe, you have to add up what Brussels does with what the member states do. Mm. And when you do that, it's very comparable. Mm. It's about 70 billion each per annum. Uh, Europe so is it overstated that the Europeans have to build up their military industrial oh no, complex? We or? have to do that uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. We need to restart production lines. We have to restock our ammunitions. Mm -hmm. We need to give companies um, long-term contracts and contracts for keeping, for building and keeping up production facilities so that they, ha they can be fair to their shareholders. And we have to assume that this war will take another eight years. If it ends earlier, that's a bonus. But, but Putin is not going away. And uh, think about the, al the alternative. What if Putin wins? Mm. He will then use, conscript Ukrainians into the Russian armed forces and use that against us. And then the expenditure on our side to deal with that will be much bigger. Mm -hmm. I've been covering NATO for over a decade, and the failure consistently of each member state to, to make that 2% of GDP. Well, um, yes, we are talking in Poland. We have a special law that's given the Polish military 2% um, of GDP for the last 15 years. Uh, and we're now at 3%, possibly going to 4% next year. And by the way, the opposition supports this. You know, we have a saying in Poland, every country has an army, either your own or a foreign one. Mm. In the long term, your own is cheaper. This message seems not to be getting through to all NATO members, however. Yes, because if you are Western European, Spanish, German, Italian, mm. you have never had a Russian soldier on your soul against your will, and you never will. Mm. But it's a little unfair for us on the, on, on, the, on the front to bear the burden of deterring Putin on behalf of richer countries. Mm. which is why I'm a strong supporter of, the, uh, of European defense, of the European Peace Facility, which is our defense budget, which is assessed in proportion to GDP. Mm. Uh, if Putin is a threat to all of Europe, and he is, all of Europe should, in solidarity, finance the effort to stop him. Yeah, and, and, and within that vein, um, 8%, or sorry, eight years you're talking about, that we should have an outlook for this conflict, potentially. That would, necessitate, would, would necessarily mean that we're going to have to raise that threshold because 2% is just not enough. It's not going to get you there. Even, yeah, but even countries are still not at 2%. My point. So, so what needs to happen? Are there penalties that need to be involved in terms of NATO members? <laughs> I mean, how do you get to that number? It is a military alliance of sovereign states who ultimately take their own decisions. Actually, the, the EU is a confederation where sovereignty... Uh, ultimately lies with the member states. You can't force sovereign states to do what they don't want to do. So all we have is persuasion. But, you know, the people of Europe are demanding European defense and are demanding uh, um, a, a, a defeat for Putin. And look, we, we, we are uh, using up our old stocks of ammunition. Uh, we need to replace them anyway. Tell me this. When you take a step back and look at uh, collective defense in Europe, what are some of the other areas of vulnerability? Are we talking about the Arctic? Well, uh, some European countries, and out of politeness, I'll, I won't name them, made themselves over-dependent on Russian energy. They, you know, we've been warning them for 30 years. Um, and uh, you know, security costs. If uh, and the bill arrived. You know, we lost. We think between one and of uh, and two percent of the global EU GDP because of the spike in gas, uh, gas and oil prices last year. Uh, so we shouldn't make that mistake again. We need to uh, uh, diversify. We are now doing what Poland has been advocating for ten years. 
we are using our power of monopsony, of being the largest customer for oil and gas, to buy gas and oil from producers collectively. Good. If we'd done that 10 years ago, Putin wouldn't have had his war chest. Yeah. When you look at a country like the United Kingdom, right now they're in the midst of a Conservative Party conference. They're going to have the Labour Party conference. Earlier this year, I had the chance to speak to Keir Starmer, who may very well be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. We talked about energy security. He told me no new drilling in the North Sea. There's been some rollback on, on Labour's plans, at least, when it comes to climate and energy, because the two are very much intertwined. Um, are you disappointed um, in what you've seen, at least coming so far from not just the United Kingdom, but other European leaders in terms of tackling that energy dynamic within the context of climate change? Look, um, since, the, uh, since Putin's invasion, uh, uh, responding to, uh, to the appeal of the uh, president of the European Commission, uh, Europeans have reduced their gas consumption by 15% just by regulating uh, our stoves and, uh, and industrial facilities a little more intelligently. That's huge. It's good for the climate, good for our pockets, uh, good um, uh, for the bottom line of our countries and bad for Putin. And I'm sure there are other solutions. Poland is uh, just uh, signing contracts to, uh, to build nuclear. We are probably going to be the first country in, in Europe to, to have uh, these small modular reactors. Uh, which is also good for the climate and, and, and bad for Putin. Ukraine, if she wins, will have a huge surplus. You know, the Zaporozhye nuclear plant is the largest in Europe. Nine gigawatts of power. And Ukraine actually is already synchronized with the European grid. Um, so if they win, we will have this um, in inflow of uh, emissions-free electricity. Good. And they're already sending energy to Europe. On, on some days, yes. Mm. Tell me this. So when you look at the sanctions, G7 sanctions on Russian oil haven't worked. I don't know. The, the, I'm told the, the cap on the price has worked. He's at least getting $15 billion this year above what was originally Sure, anticipated. but he's has having to sell to India and China at a 30% discount. Well, that's what I mean. At Good. the end of the day, the right now, the oil prices, as they rise higher, and the fact that he's managed to do this shipping, obviously without insurance means that he's still going to get a pretty good paycheck by the end of this year. And the IMF is projecting his economy grows at 1.5%. That's still a lot of growth for a country. Oh, wait a second. A country, frankly, uh, 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 uh. that is in a war economy, no? GDP is a notoriously bad indicator of this. When you switch your production from consumer products, cars, to tanks, your GDP can rise because economic activity mm. uh, can rise but it's destroying your country, your country's wealth. So you don't think it's a reflection of the real economy at all? No, I think the Russian uh, standard of living is dropping. Then tell me this, how do we then combat um, this on, a, on an economic level? Because if you look at this, uh, you're still he's still making money off his oil. Oh, and some. in the Gulf Arab countries... He had a spike in 22. The Gulf Arab countries are buying it. We know where this Russian oil is going. We know it's going to India. We know it's going to China. Is there a responsibility? But Europe was Putin's most lucrative market, and he's lost no it. No doubt. But at the same time, he's still making money off it. So my no. point is, is what is the conversation? What is the narrative that the West needs to present to these partners? Some are partners, some are allies. Uh, to, to, I wouldn't even say make them see sense, because it's not the sense that they want to hear. But in order to persuade them to wean themselves from that Russian crude. Well, sanctions, as you know, is a, is a moving target. You need mm. to... Uh, uh, improve them all the time because people find ways of going around. But, you know, the more relevant question, I think, is um, what do you say to Russian nationalists who support this war? I would say to them, look, look, your leader is making your country a vassal to China. Mm. The Chinese are taking over your goods market, your cyber market. Um, they are draining life out of the, your economy. And they're already naming places in Russia with old Chinese names. Uh, can, can you not tell where this is going? Is this really good for Russia? Mm. Well, there doesn't seem to be any <laughs> stopping Putin with his relationship with Beijing, at least not yet. But I would be, fur as a Russian patriot or nationalist, I would be furious at Putin. For this? Yes. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because when I spoke to Putin in October of 2021, there was, as always, that narrative that one day Beijing will decide that they want to take the Siberian pipeline and they want to go 
all the way to Siberia. I mean, and there are still the more first, ethnic Chinese than there are Russians in and Siberia. And for the first time, Putin has uh, 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 allowed Chinese trade via yes. what the Chinese now call Han Shenwei, Vladivostok. Mm. Well, I find very Is that good for Russia? Inevitably, he's made his choice. However, he's chosen Beijing over the West. My friend and mentor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, used to say, the choice for Russia is to be either an ally of the West mm. or a vassal of China. A vassal he of made, China. He made the wrong choice. And if I were a, a, a Russian patriot, I'd be, I'd be furious. Radek, it's great to have you here at the Warsaw Security Forum. Thanks so much for joining us.